somewhere at this missile site is our business. My firm assembles a radar package, a vital piece of a tracking system. This too, an essential part of the radar package operates on certain frequencies. Frequencies? Aren't they classified? Well, yes and no. Yes and no? I, I don't understand. I, I know I'm new around here, I'm just a trainee, but I always thought that, that frequencies well, were... Take it easy and I'll explain. This too. Do you see any information? Can you glean any from looking at it? Well, no, but you mentioned frequencies. Well, did I tell you what the frequencies were? No. See what I mean? This tube tells you nothing until it's associated with the classified radar package, which is part of the actual radar warning and tracking system. You see, we're the subcontractors. We put the tube in the radar package. Now, that makes a world of difference from a classification standpoint, because that's when the known frequency of the tube becomes associated with the system. Say, I get it. It's the association that's classified. Right. So what was I getting so excited about? Have you got a tranquilizer? Oh, you won't need it. After a while, you'll take it all in your stride. Now, I want to introduce you to a very important document, something that you have to read and digest thoroughly. Food for thought. Lots of it. You'll even learn to enjoy it. Come along with me. Here we are. This is my office. Now, let's see if I can find that document I was telling you about. There it is. It's a completed contract security classification specification commonly known as DD Form 254. As the title indicates, it's a specification for the contractor to use in identifying information that's classified and requires safeguarding measures. And it's all very simply spelled out. I don't know. Government forms always seem so complicated to me. Well, not this one. If you know all the things it can do for you, it's like having a U.S. savings bond. I'm going to let you in on something. Sit down. This particular 254, because we analyzed it thoroughly and understood everything, we were able to avoid overclassification, saving $250,000 on a contract. $250,000? <laughs> Talk about digesting a 254. For that kind of money, I'd have 254 served to me with every meal. Yeah, a quarter of a million dollars. Actually, this was the first DD Form 254 we analyzed under our new classification management system established about a year ago. Now, before that time, Kimball Electronics had to learn about security classification the hard way. Late one Saturday night, about two years ago, sleep was something to be endured. I was a security assistant then. Life at Kimball was one classification headache after another. So much so that often I thought I was literally drowning in classification problems. Confidential, confidential, secret, confidential, secret, secret, top secret, confidential, like bongo drums. Sometimes classification definitions would run through my head like a thundering herd of elephants. This is Harris. What? 
classified boxes will well put a gu put a guard on them. Oh, yeah, Saturday night. Well, have you notified the security officer? I see. Okay. I'll be right down. Here's the situation. Two boxes containing classified components were scheduled for delivery the day before, only to be delayed in transit, arriving instead on a Saturday night when the plant is closed down for the weekend. Since the man at the gate couldn't leave his post to guard the boxes, he wouldn't accept the responsibility of receiving them without an assigned guard. And there was no secure storage area. There was nothing for me to do but to accept those classified items and make the necessary arrangements to store them in a secured area for the weekend. Suddenly, something began to click in my mind. That cut seal got me thinking. Boxing and shipping those components as classified must have called for extra work, extra personnel, an escort in addition to the driver, to say nothing of my services. And I began to wonder, all those extra costs, was it necessary to classify those components? Monday morning, bright and early, I met with the vice president in charge of engineering, who also was the corporate security officer. I wanted to see the guidance for those components. There you are, George. Why don't you uh, take it along with you and analyze it, and then check back with me. Mm-hmm. Just as I thought. Components such as we received Saturday night could be unclassified. Now, it says so. Right here. In item 13, the crux of this whole business of classification. Security classification specifications for this contract are set forth below. Actually, it's the government's classification guidance to a contractor. And here's the guidance. End product is classified confidential. Not one word about the individual components. Seems to me if a component is not classified in itself and does not by itself reveal association to the classified end product, then why can't we purchase that component unclassified? Right. Those components delivered Saturday didn't show anything about the end product. Exactly. Which probably means we've been unnecessarily protecting unclassified components and paying the price. And a rather heavy price. Time labor, special packaging, guards, cost of shipping. All unnecessary expense. Look, George, why didn't you bring this up during contract negotiations? Well, if you don't mind my saying so, we're often so eager to get the business, we're inclined to overlook security expense at the time of negotiation with Uncle Sam and the front contractors. True enough, but you should have spoken up. We're in pretty deep now suddenly call something unclassified after treating it as classified certainly will raise a lot of questions. May I uh, take another look at that 254? Yes, here it is. Item 11. Refer all questions pertaining to contract security classification specification to the official name below. Now, if we were the prime contractor, we'd get in touch with the responsible classification official of the contracting activity. But we're the subcontractor. Right. So our contact is with the prime contractor. In other words, Bellport Laboratories in Arizona. Arizona? Way out there? George, this might be embarrassing. Bellport Lab is one of our biggest customers. I don't like the idea of questioning their classification guidance at this stage of the game. But uh, we're in doubt, so better find out. 
Get Bellport on the phone. Okay. Mary, would you please get me Thomas J. Finnegan? Bellport Laboratories, Tucson, Arizona. Thank you, Mr. Finnegan. Bye. Well, he says they gave us the guidance they were given. He also said uh, classified information may be involved. But since their PCO is some distance from them, we should get in touch with our own cognizant security office here in the city. Good idea. Why don't you drop down and see them? I think they're somewhere in Manhattan. Yes, here it is. The Cognizant Security Office is the Defense Contract Administration, Services Region, 60 Hudson Street. These regional offices are so situated that they're easy to reach. And the fellow to see is the classification management specialist. This man checked over our 254 to see if it was clear enough and up to date. In an emergency, all of the questions of the subcontractor are clarified by consulting directly with the prime contractor's buying activity. As for Kimball's problem, there was no question about it. There was no need to classify those components. Is that what started the new classification management system at Kimball's? No, that came later. Kimball had to suffer a severe jolt before it buckled down to the real facts of life about security classification. Beginning to get the picture? Well, yeah. Yes, I think so. What about this jolt? Um, this shock Kimball suffered, it, it sounds kind of ominous. Well, it's uh, what I call self-sabotage. Here, take a look at this. Lack of business was given as the reason for shutting down two of Bellport's major facilities. Lack of business. And it was all Bellport's fault. What do you mean? Remember what I said, self-sabotage? Well, that's what happened at Bellport. Now, let me explain. Periodically, the Cognizant Security Office makes a security inspection of facilities. Well, Bellport's security program was found to be so unsatisfactory, they were not authorized to receive classified information for two months. That was the amount of time Uncle Sam gave Bellport to clean up. Result, during that period, they lost a terrific contract to the tune of 25 million. 25 million? But that's not the whole story. It would be for me. Why, if I lost a thousand dollars, even a couple of hundred, I couldn't pay rent, buy groceries, pay utilities. I, I'd just be sick. Sick's the word. A chain reaction, just as you described. Rent, groceries, utilities, but on a tremendous scale, 3,500 workers. The whole town of Bellport suffered. And so did Kimball Electronics. Which brings up an important point. Just who is responsible for this thing called security classification? Uh, let me show you something over here. As we all know, for every one prime contractor, there can be numerous subcontractors and sub-sub and sub-sub-sub. What are known on the 254 as first-tier subcontractors and beyond first-tier. Each contractor, whether prime, first-tier, or beyond first-tier, is responsible for implementing the security classification guidance as spelled out in his particular DD Form 254. Now, what's more, the Prime is responsible for the preparation of the security classification specification of the first tier, and the first tier for the security classification specification for the next tier, and so forth. So that what affects one contractor could very easily affect the other tier subcontractors. So that this self-sabotage can react like a disease? Sort of. Well, what, what did Bellport Lab do about it? Do? Why, today, Bellport has an outstanding industrial security program and classification management system. And Kimball Electronics? A word to the wise was sufficient. We patterned our industrial security program and our classification management system after Bellport's. Now let me show you my gallery. Gallery? Oh, those photographs. 
Security is a combination of many things. After all, it's what people do and say that can make or break security. So let's start with personnel. Here we have a sample of personnel clearance. This employee is filling out a personnel security questionnaire. DD Form 48. Very interesting. Mm. Uh, I mean the uh, 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 DD Form 48. <laughs> Where do we get these forms? Some from the Cognizant Security Office, some from DISCO. That's the Defense Industrial Security Clearance Office in Columbus, Ohio. DD Form 48 goes pretty deeply into a person's background. A lot of things on it are strictly private, information just between the employee and the government. Then there's the FD-258, the fingerprint card. All employees processed for DOD top secret, secret or confidential clearance must be fingerprinted. However, employees not cleared by DOD but who require access to confidential information may be cleared by the contractor under certain circumstances. Now, in the next column, we come to storage of classified material. For top secret, secret or confidential material, we use a safe type steel file container with a built-in three position dial type changeable combination lock. This container weighs about 600 pounds. Even with all these features, in the case of top secret information, a guard patrols and inspects this area every two hours. No guard patrol is needed for secret if a general services administration approved container is used. If the container is not GSA approved, a guard patrol every four hours is required. For confidential material, there's this type container and no guard patrol is required. Actually, it's an ordinary file cabinet with a locking device. Next, we come to area controls, the closed area and the restricted area. This is a closed area. During working hours, whenever classified material is too large or just doesn't lend itself for storage in a container, a closed area like this is used. Admittance, supervised by a properly cleared authorized employee. When you see this sign, you'll know you're in a controlled area. To get beyond that door, your name is checked against a list of those cleared for access. At the close of the working day and on weekends, the entrance is locked and admittance is controlled by a guard on patrol. The same controls are used for restricted areas during working hours. At the close of the working day, all classified documents within the restricted area are returned to the approved storage container. Closed and restricted areas can be expensive. Construction, maintenance, personnel. But the cost can be negotiated under the contract if the DD form 254 is carefully analyzed. If the 254 is misinterpreted, it can be a piece of needless construction and a needless costly expense. One of the first things I learned about security was how to transmit classified information, especially by mail. As you will see in the next column, two envelopes must be used. Both of these envelopes are opaque, so the classified material can't be seen or read. Each envelope not only carries the name and address for whom the mail is intended, but the name and address of the sender as well. However, only the inner envelope is stamped with a classification. This envelope is also sealed. Now for the outer envelope. This one has no markings that could possibly indicate the classification of its contents. Top secret material is always hand carried by a properly cleared special courier. Secret may go by courier or by registered mail. Confidential may be transmitted by certified or registered mail or by a courier. Now, when it comes to the destruction of classified documents... Destruction? You mean you actually destroy classified material? And for good reasons. You see, every contractor must have a program for getting rid of classified material. Not only for security reasons, but to reduce to a minimum the amount on hand at any given time. Otherwise, you find yourself up to your neck in it. What's more, holding on to classified material that's no longer needed can be costly. 
containers, space, personnel, time, all that means money. Now, in this last photograph, destruction is being carried out by burning. Two persons are needed, both properly cleared. One is responsible for the destruction, the other serves as a witness. Of course, there are other ways of destroying classified material, but this will give you an idea. How do you like your cigar? Uh, <clears throat> fine. <coughs> Just fine. <laughs> Vice President in charge of engineering gave me these for my birthday. He's the corporate security officer. I report directly to him. That's how important classification management is to Kimball. Excuse me. Harris speaking. Yes? Half an hour. I'll be there. You like that DD Form 48, huh? That was the corporate security officer. He wants to uh, review some classified material with me for downgrading and declassification. I know, to save some money. Among other things. Periodically, contractors have to review all their classified material, especially at the completion or termination of a contract. Some classified information might be returned to the procuring contracting officer, the PCO. Some we retain for technical reference in our library. In this case, we have to get permission from the PCO. Then, too, there comes a time when it's no longer necessary to keep some information in a certain classification. For example, secret might be downgraded to confidential or even declassified. Downgrading and declassification can pay off in dollars and cents. How? By the elimination of unnecessary expense incurred in the handling of material in transit, keeping records, security clearance of personnel, to name a few of the things that can really jack up the cost. And it's all spelled out in the 254s. Hey, you're really catching on. Well, I've got to get going. While I'm gone, I want you to take a look at something. You know, the guidance in the 254s just doesn't come out of thin air. It's the result of a lot of spade work down at the Pentagon or in one of the many defense installations around the country. And it all begins with the development of the project or the program guide. And here are the men who lay the groundwork. The project manager, foreign technology specialist, classification management representative, the project manager is responsible for the development of the whole system, including such matters as design and performance characteristics and capabilities. He must also evaluate the system and its intended contribution to the national defense, and to what degree it is believed to be superior to similar systems. To help the project manager reach a true lead time evaluation, the foreign technology specialist furnishes advice on the foreign state of the art or the effect a particular weapon system might have on the international front. As for the classification management representative, he makes sure that correct classification guidance has been used in the evaluation and that it is clearly understood. So that when it's finally translated into action on the 254, the, the contractor will know what it's all about, right? Right. See, you're really catching on. Now, while I'm gone, see if you can't get those gentlemen to tell you about their project. Sure, sure. What was that? Uh, tell me something. Well, you mean that... Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Mr. Harris? Tell me. Well, that's what he said. It, he talked about that poster as if it were a living thing. Well... <laughs> What's so funny? Huh? Who said that? I could, I could have sworn I, I heard a voice. Hmm. Say, mister, you, sir, with a cigar. What? 
What, what's that? The smoke from that cigar is interfering with our <coughs> work here. Oh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm sorry. I... <laughs> That's better. Gentlemen, we have very important things to accomplish today. Our engineers are engaged in a tremendous operation involving a fabulous piece of equipment, the PZ-800 BNY-23. This piece of equipment will be a modification of the BNY-22, giving greater scope to an electronic wall or force field. You're talking, of course, about the state of the art. Yes, I am. Uh, young man, who are you? I'm a trainee, but I had no idea you could uh, talk. How else can we communicate if we don't talk things over? Uh, to get on with it, according to our engineers, the BNY-23, this more advanced model, will be able to blockade many miles of a coastal area. Indeed, it will be able to isolate an entire island of 1,500 square miles from the rest of the world. Um, sorry. Now, this force field, this electronic wall, might even be used as a sort of magnetic blanket to render a large unit of enemy troops immobile, stop them dead in their tracks. Good grief. Considering what I've said, it can be seen that the modified PZ-800 BNY-23 is a formidable addition to our arsenal of weapons. The force field is projected from the Tegula Regina, already being used in the BNY-22. My, it looks so much like a seashell. The Tegula Regina is a seashell. The mechanism that projects the force field is encased in a seashell-like housing. So much for the U.S. state of the art. Now then, would the disclosure of information related to it destroy the usefulness of the device in any way? And would disclosure help an enemy? Which brings us to the foreign state of the art. Let's hear from our foreign technology specialist. Our sources tell us that none of the foreign governments have anything like the BNY-23, although they've begun experiments. However, they do have a force field that can immobilize mice, but not men. Of mice and men? Uh, John Steinbeck wrote, uh, uh... Do they have any countermeasures? Anything that can neutralize or destroy the BNY-23's effectiveness? To the best of our knowledge, no. Suppose the BNY-23 were to fall into the hands of an enemy. Would knowledge of specific performance capabilities assist in developing or applying specific countermeasures? This is open to question. Could be a calculated risk, if specific information were obtained on the whole system. Which brings us to what this session is all about. Classification. Yes, classification. Very good, young man. Thank you, sir. Classification. What should or should not be classified? Can the weak or vulnerable elements be protected from unauthorized disclosure? How practical is it to do so? And now we'll hear from security classification management. Let's take the first question. What should or should not be classified? First of all, if the enemy knew that seashells like this were actually an electronic fence device, he would be on the lookout for them and would neutralize them somehow. As long as he doesn't know we have them, we have a good surprise factor that should be protected as long as possible. So, until it becomes known that we have adapted the Tegula Regina to be an electronic device, we need to classify that fact and classify it secret. Now let's get down to details. Range, secret. Power life, secret. We don't classify the battery because it's an off-the-shelf item, but association with the PZ-800 is secret. Oh, by the way, we've got to figure out a self-destruct in case they're disturbed once they're in place. And that will be secret. Let's see, what else? Oh, yes, the Q-rays that make up the fence. The drawings showing the electronic circuitry that creates the Q-rays, that's also secret. And, of course, the fact that Q-rays are used is secret. We will put these things in some kind of order when we write the classification guide so people can find them quickly. Well, here I am, back again. Shh. Please, Mr. Harris. There's a conference going on here. Conference? Oh, the guidance. Well, these gentlemen here have been very informative. You know, they've taught me a great deal. Thought they would. Would you like another cigar? Um, uh, no, no, thank you. The smoke seems to disturb them. <laughs> oh. Any questions? Well, not on the program guidance, you know, but I'd like to know how the classification guidance incorporated in the 254 is developed for a prime contract or a, a subcontract. Give it to you in a nutshell. Now, you know, of course, that the 254 is the basic document for classification guidance. However, where there's a need for a detailed classification breakdown, 
the DD254C is used. Now remember that basic 254, detail breakdown, 254C. Now there may be times when a major weapons program will require a more comprehensive classification guidance, in which case a classification guide is used as an attachment to the basic 254. And I think that's all we have time for today. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Um, if you don't mind, sir, uh, gentlemen, I, I wish to thank you, too, for giving me an opportunity to, uh, <laughs> to listen to you. A rare opportunity, I might add. Oh, 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 yeah. And that, um, that form. Form 48. Must remember that. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Goodbye now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, I think I'm going to like security classification management. <laughs>